Welcome to the Bill Kelly Podcast, critical discussions in critical times. Here's your host, Bill Kelly. And this is the Bill Kelly Podcast, critical discussions for critical times. I'm your host, Bill Kelly. Good to have you with us here today. Uh, we're going to veer off a little bit from, from some of the politics and some of the world events that are going on. We are going to catch up on those in, in a couple of future p- podcasts. But here in Canada, uh, this is a special week coming up because it's Grey Cup week. And you may say, well, it's football. Who cares? In Canada, this is a week where even if you're a passive fan, uh, you get interested because it is the national championship. It's like people that don't really watch baseball, but, oh, it's the World Series. Okay, I'll, I'll flick it on and see what's going on. Well, that's what's happening here. And, of course, the playoffs started uh, this past weekend. And uh, the Hamilton Tiger Cats, uh, after a mediocre season, had a shot. Uh, they went into Montreal to play the Alouettes. It did not go well. Uh, and uh, the Owls are going to go into Toronto for the Eastern Final, and we'll talk about the, the, the results of that. But to, to give us a, a, a broader concept is what's going on, and I want to talk a little bit about the future of this Tiger Cat franchise because there are more question marks than there are sureties at this point. So pleased to welcome back uh, to the podcast our good friend Josh Smith. Josh is uh, from Three Down Nation and covers uh, the CFL, and he specifically the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Josh, good to have you with us today. Thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Bill. The season ended way too soon for us. Uh, you know, I, I know I, I don't know that there are any expectations that we we're simply going to waltz into the Grey Cup, uh, but we had the same set of expectations I think that we had two years ago, uh, the first time the Grey Cup was in Hamilton. Uh, it had been the first time since nineteen well ninety six the game was here, uh, but the first time the Tiger Cats have been in the Grey Cup here at home since nineteen seventy two. So we've been waiting a long time, and 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 we were kind of hoping and praying that that that, that Grey Cup a couple of years ago was going to work out. It didn't. Uh, we can. I'm not going to go over all the calls. You know, the, the giving up points and over that sort of stuff. It didn't happen. So we figured, okay, it's back in Hamilton. Uh, we got a pretty good team. A big off-season signing with Bo Levi Mitchell. Uh, we were short at quarterback. This is supposed to be the guy who's going to get us there. And uh, well, to put it quite bluntly, it didn't work out the way it should have. And we wanted it to, but we still made the playoffs. And, you know, hope springs eternal, right? Like old Casey at the Vat, you know, poem from years ago. You know, once you're in the, the dance for the playoffs, anything can happen. Uh, the problem we had last Saturday in Montreal is nothing happened. Uh, nothing happened the way it was supposed to for us. And it was a, a pretty blasé at, at exit, I guess, for a team that, that could have and should have done better. It was an incredibly disappointing exit to the season. It The, the day of the game... I, I, I go for my customary walk around where I live. I, I was listening to some music and I just, I saw people in tie cats gear and I started getting that feeling of, Oh, maybe today's the day we'll, we'll get this one. And then we go into Toronto and then anything can happen. And then a home great cup and you get yourself wrapped up to it. And then you sit down to watch the game and it was boring. I mean, it was the offense did nothing. The defense played well, but the offense did absolutely nothing in that game. They, they didn't score a touchdown, which you're not going to win very many football games yeah. if you don't find the end zone. Kick relied on four field goals. It was it was just an incredibly disappointing wave. It, it's one thing for teams to lose going out on your shield, so to speak. You know what I mean? Like if they get, you can tell. Oh man, they just they just ran up against a better team, or they went shot for shot and they just didn't get the ball last. You can the 2021 Grey Cup here in Hamilton is a perfect example of that. They had their opportunity. They send that game to overtime. Like. That was a great game played between two really good teams and the team that got the ball last made the, made the, made the biggest play in this one against Montreal. It was just, you could tell from the start, there was just something missing. Like they, they had the good first drive and then they fumble. And then it was going into the game. You you can't turn the ball over. You can't make mistakes. Montreal's a good team. They did everything they couldn't do. And that's why they packed their bags on Monday. And it's another wait until next year for Tiger cat fans. It, It was just a very disappointing way for the season to, <clears throat> pardon me for the season to end given the expectations this team had going into the year well and you wrote about it in your call on the next day on three down nation uh, you know even in a playoff game where teams are quote unquote evenly matched and i i guess you could make that argument between hamilton and montreal this year uh, mistakes make the difference in other words turnovers bad plays missed coverages things like that uh we made a ton of them montreal didn't and and that was the difference in the game really wasn't it Yep. They took untimely penalties. They turned the ball over. They didn't capitalize when they could have just everything that could go wrong, did go wrong. And it, this wasn't a case of the Alouettes forced these issues. Now it's not, the turnovers were, were Montreal doing their thing and, and Montreal's got a really good defense with a really good defensive coordinator. So you kind of expect them to 
to get on the ball and do stuff like that. But it was a lot of self-inflicted wounds. And this team, this entire season had been self-inflicted wounds. It's the reason they finished eight and 10. It's the reason they were third place in the East. They couldn't get out of their own way. Most of the time, it's an unfortunate way for the season to end. And uh, now we go into the off season, tons of questions around this team. Now, who's going to be where, who's going to be back. Who's not going to be. It's, I didn't expect this offseason to be as eventful as it's going to be, but it's never boring covering this team. There's always something, some sort of drama, some sort of who knows who, like we're, we're going to deal with quarterback questions. I'm sure we're going to talk about it in a bit, yeah, but yeah. we're going to deal with quarterback questions again for like the third or fourth straight year. Like this team just never, never stays out of the headline. So it's good for me. It's good for my business, but it's not necessarily <laughs> great for Tiger cat fans who just want sometimes a nice, calm, calm off season, getting ready for the for the upcoming year. Not going to be that. And, way and part of this, all. by the way, is just the way the CFL has has evolved over the last number of years. Uh, most times, they offer one, two year contracts to players. You <laughs> very rarely see long term contracts for anybody in this league, no matter how good they are, no matter how bad they are. Uh, so, as a result, every off season, we got a list. And, and earlier this week, we got the list of, of potential free agents. Uh, uh, for the league, not just for the Tiger Cats. And in most cases, Josh, it's half their roster. Yep. Um, you know, they're all coming up. Now, a lot of these guys are probably going to be re-signed, mm-hmm. uh, no matter what team we're talking about, Ottawa, Montreal, BC, whatever the case might be. But there are some key players here. And I guess let's start right with the most contentious one. Uh, the guy who was the big signing in the offseason, uh, Bo Levi Mitchell, didn't play a whole lot. I think he started. he was dressed for six games this year. Uh, we play 18 in this league, by the way, for those who may have forgotten that. Uh, So that's a problem. Uh, He did not look like the superstar that a lot of people hoped that he would be this year, even in the games in which he played. So you get to the playoffs. Okay, it's it's a one game, you win or lose in Montreal. And the team announces that he's not going to start. As a matter of fact, he didn't get in until six minutes left in the game. Uh, Matthew Schultz didn't play well, didn't. I don't want to hang it all on him. But, you know, it's not as if we said, well, this guy's hot. Let's just keep going with him. Uh, He wasn't hot. Uh, but he got by. But the message here is is what I wanted to ask you about. When the team announces the day before the playoff game that's going to win or lose their season for them, and they say, yeah, that guy we spent in the offseason four tons of money on, he's not going to be a starting quarterback. What does that tell you? And what does that tell Bo Levi Mitchell? Well, Bo said after the game in comments I'm sure you saw, comments we wrote about on three down, yep. he doesn't expect to be back next year. And given how his season went, given how he spent the majority of a playoff game the, the you bring the reason Bo Levi Mitchell was a Hamilton Tiger cat in 2023 was they went through the season last year with Dane Evans as the starter and felt that's the missing piece. We don't have the answer at quarterback. So they go out and get a guy who had won two great cups, who had been the great cup MVP twice, who had won two most outstanding players awards. They went and got for lack of a better term, the CFL's version of Tom Brady, all he did in Calgary was win. Yeah, they thought yeah. we're going to bring him into Hamilton. He's going to bring that culture here, just like Brady did when he left New England to go to Tampa Bay. Unfortunately, he gets hurt. That happens. He's been injured quite a bit the last few years. And and in the nature of sports, the especially football, the older you get, the mm-hmm. more susceptible yard injuries. But when he played, he didn't play well. And then to not play him in the playoff game, the sole reason you brought this guy in was he's the guy that's going to take us over the hump. Last year, and this is, this is the thing about the Tiger Cats that was maybe the most frustrating all season. This was a carbon copy of last year. The 2022 season, they finished 8 10, third place in the East, losing the East semifinal to Montreal. We fast forward a full calendar year, and what happens? Third place in the East, 8 10 record, losing the semifinal to Montreal. Matthew Schultz got into that game. He starts this game. He wasn't great, like you said. But you got to think, and Bo, as I said, Bo said, what's the motivation to bring him back next year? What's the. I mean, money is obviously the, always the motivation. I, I'm, I'm talking about from like a, a like an egotistical, and I'm not mm-hmm. saying most egotistical, but you know that like competitive spirit. Like Bo wants to play, and Bo wanted to play in that game, and he was asked bluntly, like, Are, were you healthy enough to play? And he said yes. And you could tell if you've seen the video to any of your listeners out there, he's clearly frustrated with the yeah. fact that he didn't play in the game on Saturday. And now this is this is the what I alluded to earlier. This is the quarterback questions we have with this team. Bo's still under contract for another two years and a three-year extension. Very rare, like you said, guys don't sign long-term deals in the CFL. He signed a three-year extension in January, so he is under contract. So unless the Tiger Cats decide to cut him or, or trade him, he will be back next year. But what does that entail? Does does that will that bring about any more sort of 
Like, it, will anyone be satisfied if this team rolls back with the same quarterbacking group as as they did this year? Because we saw that they didn't get the job done. Like, can we rely on Bo Levi Mitchell to stay healthy for a full season? I think the answer to that question is definitively no, because he hasn't since 2018. He's missed games. And now he comes into a situation. He thought he was going to be the guy. He, we, he In the situation that they brought him in for to get this team over the hump come playoff time where he has been spectacular throughout his career, he staples to the bench until, like you said, six minutes left in the game. It's a it's a confusing. I didn't understand the decision when they made it. I, going into the game, Coach Orlando Steinhauer said, "Like we're going to roll with two quarterbacks," and that and my ears perked up there. And I said, "Okay, you know what? You Bo plays. They have some because Schultz is a Matthew Schultz is a really good runner. He can throw, but he can also run. He's got that athleticism that Bo kind of lacks. Never Bo never really had. It. He's more of a pocket passer, which is fine." But I thought, okay, you're going to have some packages for Matthew Schill. He'll come in. You don't know if he's going to throw. You don't know if he's going to run. Other teams have done that. Ticats have done that. Jeremiah Mazzoli, Dane Evans. Dane Evans, Matthew Schill. We've seen it before. It's worked. Okay. I, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of the two QB system. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are. And I, but I, I don't tend to like it all that much. I like to roll with one guy. But then when they made the, the decision to start Schiltz, I was like, I don't get this at all. I don't get – like, because you're not going to bring in Bo for, like, sub packages or anything like that. And then for him not to get into the game until the very end and for him to say that was the plan the entire time, just another another question mark that we have. And a big one going – like, you're, I'm sure we're going to talk about the free agent players and all those guys too, but this is the biggest one hanging – because the quarterback's most important position on the team. For this to be a question mark now going into the offseason again – I just don't know where to, where this team's going to turn. Like, if it's not Bo, and I've been trying to, ever since the, the, that happened, I've been kind of bouncing around, okay, what's his options? What are the Ticats options? And it feels to me like a reconciliation is really the only thing, because I don't think there's a ton of landing spots for him, and I don't think the Ticats have very many options outside of him, quite well, frankly. Well, here's the problem, though, and, and, and I want to get into some of the rationale behind the decision. And, and as to why he didn't start that playoff game, uh, I don't think anybody in ma- senior management went down there and say, I don't start him. I, I, I know Scott oh, no, Mitchell no, no. very well. Uh, that's, that's not what they do. Okay. No. Uh, so this was the coaching decision. Yep. Uh, and you got to ask yourself and, and as, if, as the head coach, uh, you know, coach O's job is to say, who have I got the best chance with? And I don't buy that crap. That you, well, you know, uh, Schultz is a better mobile quarterback. Anthony Calvillo couldn't run if his life depended on it. Agreed. And he won a couple of great cups with the Alouettes and, and set <laughs> CFL playoff records that still stand. You Danny, designed, Danny McManus was a statue. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, he didn't even run off the field, for God's sake. You know, he just walked. You know, that was not Danny's style. Uh, but, you know, he was the last time we won a Grey Cup. It was Danny Mack that was playing quarterback. You designed your offense around the guy you think is going to win for you. I, I, I think, and this is what really concerns me at this stage, when they made the decision, going to two quarterbacks essentially means we're not starting this guy, even though he, he makes the most money. They were basically saying, Bill, we don't have faith in you to get the job done today. And and I'm not talking about, you know, hurting his ego. Uh, you know, you're making a lot of money. You're in a, a football team. Uh, I don't care about your ego. But when the the management says you're not the guy for us today, uh, that's not just a mes- message for the day. That That's a message to say, uh, we've lost faith in you. We don't think you're going to make this anymore. And and how did, how does a guy like that bounce back? Now, we heard his, his post-game comments, you know, that he, he couldn't understand that. I, one of the ones that jumped out for me, he says, you know, uh, you get into a playoff game and, and the highest paid guy in the roster is not starting. I, I don't care about that. I, he's, he should be the highest performing guy on the roster that starts. And and that was not Bo. So I, I want to put that on the on the – check sheet right now uh but neither was it Matt Schultz either I mean these guys were in a problem here and you don't just go with the best to try to win the game in a situation like that and they didn't do it and I I just have to wonder how he can go back into training camp uh and and I know under most you know you and I talk about this offline uh, the worst time for an athlete to talk after a game is is right after the game because they're too emotional they're too wrapped up in this and uh is oftentimes they say things that, you know, their filter is not on and they oh, shit, I wish I hadn't said that. And I'm sure he feels that way after the fact. But how do they go forward and say he's still our guy? And what bothered me about Coach Joe's comments, even the day after, uh, you know, the, the wrap-up press conference for the football team, he still didn't place any faith in Bo Levi. He just said, yeah, he's still under contract. He's still a Hamilton Tiger Cat. Well, who gives a crap about whether he's still a quarterback or not? Is he your guy? And I don't know that that they, they can answer that right now. Why would you, if you're the team and you've decided going into your biggest game of the year, the guy that you're paying half a million dollars to is not good enough to win you that football game. Why would you then think a full off season, 
of nothing, not seeing him play because they don't play games. Why would you bring him back at that salary thinking he, he's going to rec- – like you've seen him now for a full year, You, regardless of what you saw because he came back late in the season. I thought played decently well against BC and Saskatchewan in those games. He played all right against Montreal yeah. in the finale as well. Like he was like – he wasn't great, but it was like, okay, he's he's still – capable I think would be the word that I would use and then in the biggest game of the year you say no the guy that we like you said all the hoopla all the everything bringing him in and we're not going to play you how does he come back from that and, and I, I agree with you. it's not an ego thing it's just a the team showed they don't have faith in him so if the team doesn't have faith in him how are they going to then sell not just to themselves but to the fan base at large which is an important part of this because ticket sales matter in this league how do you sell we didn't believe in him in November but you got to believe him in June and we're going to believe in him this year. It's just, it's a, it's a very stinky situation, quite frankly. And I just don't know how either side comes back from it. The only thing I can think of is sometimes time heals wounds. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, but does that, does it heal the football team? It may heal the wounds, no. Yeah, but you know, true. when, when coach O says we're going to go with two quarterbacks, all right. And they're playing lousy football. I mean, they're trailing uh, Montreal's going up and down the field kind of at will sometimes. Although I think, as you said, the defense, I thought played relatively well. They're just on the field too long and it kind of wore them down in the fourth quarter. But you put that guy in with six minutes left in the game or eight minutes or whatever it was. I mean, come on. That's like you're down 10, nothing and say, OK, Bo, go win it for us. Um, mm-hmm. you, you know, it, it was it was almost a token gesture to put him into the yep. game at that stage. And, it, and that, it was almost that, disrespectful. It was almost yeah. like, it was like it was meant as like disrespect. Like we said, we'd play both of you guys. This is the plan. All right, I guess go in there and do what. Like by then, by by the time he gets in the game, they're down two scores and it's two major. I think they were down at the time. I think he gets in the game. And I think it was twenty four twelve. And it's like he's uh, like he's coming in cold. The team's been ice cold all day. You're gonna start to you're gonna sit. You tell me you're gonna start two quarterbacks and. You saw, I, I'm, I, if you were online at all during that game, you saw the chatter. It was like, this team wasn't doing anything offensively. And everyone's like, okay, what about at halftime? Are they making the switch? They said they're going to play both. Now's the time to, because if Bo gets in there at half, again, maybe the game ends the same way. I don't know. But at least then it would have looked like, okay, we had this plan, didn't work. We're going to give the other guy a chance. This just felt like a, a, like you said, a token gesture of just like, we said you'd play. All right, go in there, muck around for five minutes, and then we'll, we'll, we'll end this game and we'll go into the off season. It, was, it, just, it just felt wrong. And here's the thing. I mean, going into the offseason right now, and I want to, for a second, go back to the last offseason, okay? And that was quarterback carousel in the CFL. A mm-hmm. lot of quarterbacks changed teams. Bowl came to Hamilton. Uh, you know, the Argos were looking for a quarterback. Uh, they dumped, uh, well, I guess he dumped himself, really. And they ended up with uh, with Chad Kelly. That's worked out pretty well for them. But Saskatchewan dumped their quarterback. Uh, uh, Van- Vancouver had a, a real quandary as to where they were going to go with their quarterback. Uh, and on and on it goes. And, uh, you know, you look at and well Montreal for that matter too, mm-hmm. but you know Fajardo finally ending up with the Alouettes, uh, so when they were set, uh, that's not going to happen this off season. There's not a whole lot of quality quarterbacks going to be available uh, this off season. Uh, so where do you go? It, it, which begs the question: If not Bo, then where are you going to go? Is Matthew Schultz your guy? I don't think so. No, he can't. Not after not. Uh, and I went into that game, and uh, I do a podcast with my friend Mike, as your listeners know. Yeah. Uh, and we we actually said that on the show going into the East final, we uh, we said this is a chance for Matthew Schultz to make a lot of money. I he he brought up Matthew Schultz start, and I literally said Ching because if he plays well, he could have been the starter for this team or another team going forward. He played horribly. He can't be the guy. And like you said, last year was QB carousel time. This year. I've I've looked at the guys that even even though they're under contract, you could say might be available. Jeremiah Mazzoli is one of them coming off a couple injured years in Ottawa. Mm-hmm. Trevor Harris is another one coming off an injured year in Saskatchewan. But my thing with that is, even if you go to get one of those guys, aren't you just trading the problem you had, which is an older injury prone quarterback for another older injury? Like that doesn't fix anything. I don't think they can go in with Taylor Powell as well as I think Taylor Powell played. He's not ready to be a full time. No, he's not ready for prime league. time. Not at all. Not at all. And I know there's a lot of people out there and I've seen it on social media asking me this question. Like you saw what the lions did two years ago with Nathan Rourke, young quarterback, didn't get paid a lot of money. They could build a team around him. You saw what the Argos did this year with Chad Kelly, younger quarterback, didn't pay him a lot of money until he got his extension this year. And then you can build a team around him. I don't think Taylor Powell is Chad Kelly or Nathan Rourke. Like, those guys are special talents. They're also older players. T- Taylor Powell was a literal rookie. Nathan Rourke had had a little bit of NFL experience. Chad Kelly is almost 30, for crying out loud. Like, he's young in CFL standards, but in football standards, he's been around the block. He played. He, he was in the NFL for years before he came up here. 
I, do you go with a young guy? I don't think you can. I don't, I, cause now you're, then you'd have to sell the fan base on, okay, we're going to build for a year. Like it's been, a, uh, you know, a quarter century since we've won a championship, but we're going to then not, I, I just don't know how you, I, that, this is why I think that the reconciliation between the two is the only way forward is because I just don't know what the other option is because all the other options to me are either the same problem just with a different name or it's you're going with someone untested. And as, as much as th- this team did that in 2013, they had Henry Burris. They let him go. They brought in Zach Kolaris. There's not another Zach Kolaris waiting out there. You know what I mean? Like we had seen a lot of him in Toronto in, in 2012 and 2013 when he was there to be like, feel, to feel comfortable. He can be a starting quarterback. But that was another one of those carousel years. I mean, Kolaris yep. was contract was up. Uh, clearly Kent Austin and the management here didn't have a whole lot of faith in, in, in Hank Bear. Uh, and, and so they made that change and it worked out until mm-hmm. sadly he got injured. Uh, but that was a guy that had a proven track record. And so in other words, there's a proven veteran that's had success in this league and he's available. Let's go get him. And they did. And that was, that was a smart move. They don't have those options anymore. Right now it's, it's a shot in the dark. It's like throwing darts in a black room and saying, oh, I wonder if I hit even hit the board, let alone the bullseye. So I, I don't know how they're going to do that, which leads us to my next question. What about the coach? Uh, you, you've seen the pin, things on social media. I saw some of the reaction to your columns uh, from some of the fans over the last uh, time for Odego. Kind of, you know, no faith in him. And a lot of this, and of course, when you lose like they did this past weekend, it brings up all the other bad blood, you know, about the coaching decisions, uh, giving up points in the, in the overtime of the Grey Cup two years ago, which might have cost them, probably did cost them, and some other questionable calls along the way. And say, okay, that's that's just too much. There's a body of mistakes here. Do you fire the coach? I, and I'll go right on record as saying, I don't think so. I don't think you do. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I'm in the same boat. I don't think he's a bad coach. No. I don't think he – I think he's a very – I mean, this team, again, we have to – I know the ultimate judge of success is championship rings. I understand that. But this team's been to the playoffs every year under his stewardship. They had the 15-3 and season. And I know the past is the past. It doesn't matter. But this team is, whether they win a championship or not, are in the, the, they have an opportunity. Every, they make the postseason. Do you think, do you think the Edmonton Elks or the Ottawa Red Blacks wouldn't kill to have what the Ticats have had the last four years? Those, those two teams have been a complete disarray. Hamilton's at least had a chance. Now, do they need to be better? Absolutely. Do I think coach Orlando Steiner can do that? I do. I, we've seen him coach really well. I, I don't, I don't buy the he needs to go thing. They made the change at offensive coordinator. That worked a little bit, did not work against Montreal. Obviously, the offense was putrid, but. I think that maybe there should be coaching staff changes. Maybe they take some some stuff up because back in, I think it was 2021, Steinauer was flirting with becoming the defensive coordinator at the University of Washington. He decides to stay. They give him a bump. They make him the president of football operations. I do wonder, and that, and that happened, and then all of a sudden you see the team start to struggle a little bit. I think he's a phenomenal head coach. I really, really do. I just wonder if maybe he's got too much on his plate trying to juggle the front office. Maybe if there's Bingo. a better... Bingo. Right. Exactly it. Uh, don't do that. I mean, I know Belichick's done it in New England, and it's not working out that well for him either these days. But let him coach, mm-hmm. uh, because you have written about this in the past, and I've seen this by talking to former players, because nobody wants to talk about their, their coaching staff while they're on the team. Uh, players that have a coach and general manager usually are pissed off at this person individually, because that's the same guy they have to negotiate contracts with. Yep. And and if you have a general manager and a coach, the coach could just say, look, yeah, I know they were they were really being assholes about this, uh, but I'm going to make this work for you and let's go. When it's the same guy, uh, it causes problems. And I think there's some friction. Not it's it's not overt, but I think it's there. And I don't know, I, I don't know Orlando that well. I've, I've we've talked a number of times over the years, but we're not we're not close in any way, shape, or form. I don't know if he's comfortable with that. You know, because you know exactly what happens. It's the same thing in show business as it is in football. If you want to give somebody a bump in salary, you have to give them another job mm-hmm. so you can justify it. You can't go to management and say, all right, Josh has been a pretty good guy. Let's uh, double his salary. No, no, we're going to say Josh is now in charge of, uh, you know, uh, Tiger Cat football and, and you know, cleaning out his desk or cleaning out. In other words, they have to give them some other quote unquote responsibilities. So they, they brought O back and they said, okay, you're, you're in charge of football operations. I don't think he wants to be. Now, I don't know that. He's never told me that, and I, but I just get the sense he wants to just coach because I can do that, and I'm pretty good at it. Let somebody else do all this other stuff, and, and I hope management gets that, that, that message. Well, and here's the thing, and I'm, this is not – I'm not reporting this or anything, but 
Kyle Walters is the general manager of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Yeah. And he's out of contract at the end of this season. And he is a former Hamilton Tiger Cat player. He played on the championship team with Orlando Steinauer. If I'm the Tie Cats, I am going, I, the second his contract is up, I am calling Kyle Walters and I am saying, we have a blank check. Look what he did in Winnipeg with the Bombers. That team, if you go back to when Kyle Walters took over, they were devoid of Canadian talent. They were devoid of talent, period. They were horrendous. And they built that up over a number of years. And look where they are now. They're on the verge of going to their fourth consecutive Grey Cup. They and won- exactly, you know, and, and, and you look at the protocol here, because when they made that move and hired Kyle Walters there, and Danny Max there too in a, in a mm-hmm. secondary position, but they, they basically hired Mike O'Shea as coach and said, oh, just coach the football team. Yep. We'll look after everything else. You just coach them. And how did that work out? Pretty exactly. well. Exactly. And the thing is, too, it's like now it's, it starts to seem like because Kyle Walsh has done such a good job. Are they going to now, is Winnipeg going to make this mistake that Hamilton made? And they're going, Kyle Walters is going to leave, he's going to go somewhere else, he's going to build someone else up, which I think he'd be great. I, I just think he's a wonderful general manager. Mm-hmm. Are they going to hand then the front office to O'Shea? And then that's good. And then we're going to see the Bombers take a, take a little bit of a dip. You know what I mean? Like this dual general, like you mentioned Belichick, Bill Parcells did it as well. But I mean, we're going back. And like, I mean, it's easy to for Bill Different Belichick. time. You're right. Different and, time. And Bill Belichick, it's very easy for him to negotiate with players because he'll just walk in there and drop six Super Bowl rings on the desk and go, you have to trust what I'm going to do because I've had all this success. Now, like you said, not very successful now. Steinhauer's had success. He hasn't had that level of success. So you're right. Dealing with players on the field during practice and then having to negotiate a contract with them and being the guy that's like, we're not nickel and diming you, but the team is always going to try to get the best value. They're going to sure. try to get you at as low a number you can. The player wants as high as number as he can. Usually you meet somewhere in the middle, but there can be some contention there. We've seen in other sports, arbitration cases where players go in NHL and MLB players go into these arbitration cases and hear their teams just say all the reasons why they stink. And it's like, but I batted 375 and I had 48 home runs and 106 RBI and we won 97 games and made it to the World Series. And it's like, no, but you did this. You didn't do this. You did, and that's what it's got. And that's really difficult for the coach that's in, in the locker room going, everyone give it their all. And then afterwards, it's like, well, I got to negotiate a contract with whomever the player is. doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then tell them, like, I'm, I'm in the locker room telling them, yeah, you guys are doing great. Yeah, stick together, blah, blah, blah. And then on this, in this other avenue, I'm telling them, no, this is where we got to get better. This is where you got to get better. This is, this is why we can't pay you what you want. That's that will breed contention, just just human nature. Like I don't I don't blame the player. I don't blame blame Steinhauer or anybody in that situation. That would just breed contention, just basically being people who they are. Well, here's what's going to happen. I mean, and, and once again, as you just mentioned, uh, we're into another 2023 offseason uh, in, in this. Some key decisions need to be made. And, and we're at the point in this league right now, especially with, in, in the East, uh, where the, the offseason is, is probably more dramatic than the regular season when it comes to what's <laughs> going to be happening. Uh, Josh, we're going to leave it here for now. Always a pleasure to have you on the program. Thanks so much for this today. Really appreciate it. Anytime. You know what, Bill? It's going to be a very eventful offseason here it in is. Hamilton. So I, I, await, I, I await the call to come back on, and we'll be chatting probably many, many times over the next few months. Well, you're on quick dial, so we'll, we'll do that again real <laughs> soon. Josh Smith, uh, for 3 Down Nation. And that's it for this edition of the Bill Kelly Podcast. Thanks for listening, and thanks for subscribing at the same time. Now, as always, we do welcome your comments and your suggestions. You can reach us on YouTube, Facebook, anywhere that you get your podcasts. And uh, we look forward to those discussions. Until next time, I'm Bill Kelly. You take care. This podcast was brought to you by Rebecca Wizens and her team at Wizens Law. Rebecca Wizens is a 20-time winner of the Hamilton Reader's Choice Awards for their exceptional client care and legal practice specializing in personal injury, car accidents, accidental falls, and Wilson Estates. Now, if you or a loved one have been seriously injured, or if you want to make sure that your family is taken care of for the future with the will and powers of attorney, call Rebecca Wizens, 905-522-1102 for a free consultation. When life happens, you can rely on Rebecca Wizens and Wizens Law. And trust me, Rebecca is my wife, and I don't know what I'd do without her. That's Wizens Law, 905 905- 522-1102 for a free consultation. Subscribe to my Substack for timely news updates and commentary straight to your inbox. Let's keep the conversation going. I'd love to hear your thoughts on today's episode. Let me know what you think we should be talking about next by contacting me through my website at www.billkelly.co. Thanks for tuning in. This is Bill Kelly. Till next time, you take care. <laughs>